Recognition of International Day of Yoga Experts Committee and the Task Force of Ayush Government of India. He will be our chair for the session. We welcome you, sir. May I now invite Ms. Suhag Shukla, Executive Director of the Hindu American Foundation, uh, to join us on the dais. May I now request Ms. Noof Marwai, founder of Arab Yoga Foundation based in Saudi Arabia, to join us on the dais. I will now invite Mr. Gopi Kalayel, Chief Evangelist, Brand Marketing at Google and the founder of the yoga program for Googlers called Yoglers, to join us on the dais. I will now hand over the proceedings of the session to Dr. Nagendra. <clears throat> Congratulations to India Foundation. My dear brothers and sisters, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here to chair this conference in soft power for yoga. You should slightly excuse for my little grass throat. <clears throat> yoga emerged as the big soft power thanks to our Prime Minister who suggested that June 21st should be celebrated as the International Day of Yoga. And what a response. 194 countries you know, agreed and all the 194 countries voted positively. Among them, <clears throat> 177 member countries co-sponsored and the OII, 47 members you know, sponsored. That was the biggest thing. Our Prime Minister was selling, that was the biggest contribution or surprise for me that the Islamic countries came forward in such big numbers for the whole thing. You know. Since then, yoga has gone and abated, spreading throughout the world, and every June 21st is being celebrated with more and more people participating in that. So what to do on June 21st was the challenge. So all the yoga people came together to form a protocol of 35 minutes which will bring about the traditional dimension of yoga, evidence-based yoga, and the holistic yoga, which can be done by everybody, by practice by everybody throughout the world. That was the challenge. And we had that 35 minutes protocol, <coughs> which consisted of the losing practices, the prayer, the asanas, the pranayama, the meditation, and the sankalpa, and the emotion culture, all things put together in one package. And that is the biggest contribution to make yoga get standardized. And then it has to be propagated and has to be practiced by a large number of people. And therefore the ministry, all ministries came forward to train the people. In all the 660 districts, the yoga teachers were trained to make the people practice this. Our target was 10 crores of people to practice in India and at least about 100 to 120 countries. And nearly about seven crores of people practiced the first time. Then it went on increasing. And this year, our target was 40 crores, and we must be calculating that in greater number, about 30 crores of people have practiced this protocol. That is the biggest thing that happened, and more and more countries are coming forward to see that it spreads throughout the country. I don't have to tell how yoga is beneficial for everyone in the society. No. Yoga has a message for all. Swami Kavalayananda heralded from Kaviladam long back, about 100 years back almost. And since then, yoga has brought its dimension of usefulness to everyone in the society. And it can become the real beneficiary only if you can bring the dimension to our education field. That was the dream. And Fortunately, the entire MHRD came forward and 
the NCT, <coughs> which trains nearly 30, 13 lakhs of people every year, made yoga compulsory. Then the NCRT came forward and formed the syllabus for that, two levels. Higher education started coming up. <coughs> this is how it started spreading. And then in the health field, yoga started coming up, and our Prime Minister gave a direction. India is becoming the diabetic capital of the world. Can we prevent it? <coughs> so he said, government and yoga institutions should join together to make it possible. And it was three years back we started, and we had extensive screening operations in 60 districts. 2.5 lakh people were screened. <coughs> then we had three months training of yoga, and wonderful results have come. The biggest ever project in this thing. Based on that, now it has been taken up as a national program in the country. What next? Cancer. And we are going to screen in 120 districts nearly two crores of people in the country, oral cancer, breast cancer, and cancer cervix, and see that yoga can be helpful. <coughs> yoga has to be brought in its traditional way. At the same time, bring the evidence base. That's most important. So in our university, Swami Vivekananda Yoga Sandan Samsthan, we are bringing up the evidence base for yoga over the last 30 years. Whatever we teach has to have a foundation nicely. And we have been doing this research and publishing papers. And our first paper in British Medical Journal in 1986 brought forth yoga to the world community at large. Yoga therapy, therapeutic applications of yoga for bronchial asthma. Since then, we have nearly 600 research papers published in various index journals of international repute. Now more and more are coming up. This is how research is the main base which we had to put to see that it gets acceptable in all the institutions all over the world. This is our direction that we are giving the whole thing. <clears throat> Particularly, the Aurogya Dhamma in our Prashanti Kotelam campus, we have a holistic approach. So we can understand, come by the best of the East to the best of the West. So best of the West is modern scientific research. Best of the East is yoga. So we have to combine modern medical system with our Ayush systems. <coughs> Initially, we started off with yoga, yoga therapy, integrated approach of yoga therapy. And gradually, now we have added on Ayurveda, naturopathy, acupuncture, physiotherapy, all under one roof. The results have been very, very fascinating. That people who used to take about 15 days to get the results, now they get it in five days, six days. And that is the beauty of combination, the integrative system. So we have to have a new healthcare delivery system and yoga can come to the forefront. That is the integrative medicine. And we must have such a health system, a healthcare delivery system, which is cost effective and it is very effective and evidence based and no side effects at all. And that is our goal. Then India can become the leaders in this entire dimension. That's what yoga can do. As most of you know, yoga is not merely asanas or pranayam or mudras or bandhas or kriyas or physical exercise. It's a science of holistic living. Working at all the levels, at the body level, prana level, mind level, emotional level, intellectual level. As the Upanishad puts it, we have the five layers, Annamaya Kosha, Pranamaya, Manomaya, Vijnana, Anandamaya Kosha, and yoga works at all levels. We have the four streams of yoga. Gnana Yoga to work with the intellect, Raj Yoga, the Patani Yoga working with the willpower, Bhakti Yoga, the working with the emotions to gain mastery over the emotion, and Karma Yoga to bring it to day-to-day -day practice, to convert every action into a yoga. That's Karma Yoga. And these four streams of yoga have been heralded and brought forth very nicely in the integrated approach of yoga therapy that we are doing in all the education system. That is the great contribution of Swami Vivekananda to bring all the yoga systems into a wise integrated approach. Intellect level, willpower level, emotional level, and day-to-day -day life level. So with this, the whole dimension of yoga is spreading, and this is the great contribution of India. <clears throat> So 
So the MEA has started spreading this to larger and number larger countries. So they are deputing the people who are selected from different countries to our university to undergo a one month long iTech yoga instructor course. And so far, we have nearly 295 participants from 75 countries who have been put forth here and they have come, they got the real dimensions of this yoga instructor course and they are spreading this message throughout the world. And this is how the soft power is coming up throughout the world and yoga can contribute more and more in the field of education, in the field of health, in the field of stress management, for the corporate sector, <coughs> everywhere yoga can come up in a big way. With this, we have to go further. What's it we have to do? In our country, there is no regulatory body for yoga, for health and naturopathy. We have to bring in a regulatory body to see that we streamline the entire thing. There are two groups of yoga teachers. People who learn by themselves and are, get trained by some of the yoga institutions and claim to be yoga teachers, yoga therapists, and yoga masters in the country. This all has to be regulated. Otherwise, people just learning for one or two days, they claim to be the yoga experts in the world. So this has to be prevented. For that, the Ministry of Aish took up the challenge, and about four years back, we developed the protocol for certifying the people into level one, level two, level three. Level one yoga instructor, level two yoga teachers, and so on. And we gave this thing to QCI to develop an SOP to see that it is possible. Now, therefore, the entire system has been set, and now it is taken over by the Ministry of Aish, and Yoga Certification Board has been formed. Therefore, anybody can apply for the certification. They might have done yoga by themselves and learned from various institutions. We don't care. There may be any age group. It may be only 8 years old or 80 years old, male, female, anything. And they will apply and then we will test them. The theoretical knowledge, the practical knowledge, communication skill and the teaching techniques. The four dimensions are tested and once they pass that, they will get the certification. So far, about 2,500 such people have been certified by the Yoga Certification Board. Now it is growing more and more and we hope to have hundreds and thousands and thousands of people, maybe a lack of people by one or two years so that yoga gets standardized. Then at the higher education level, the University Grant Commission of the MHRD came forward and said, yes, we should have now standardized yoga modules. <coughs> For that purpose, a committee was formed, all the experts of yoga, and we formulated the nice yoga protocols for the bachelor's degree, master's degree, doctoral program, and the syllabus have all been put forth nicely as available today. Therefore, in all the yoga universities where they are going to start the departments of yoga, or where already they have the department of yoga, they have got a direction. And this was the lacuna that we had. We did not have a standard yoga programs, course, curriculum, syllabus, and everything in the whole country. Therefore, we have formulated that. So, a National Accreditation Assessment Council, NAC, is having this national program, and all the departments of yoga started in the central universities and other universities will undergo this NAC certification. That's how yoga is getting standardized in the generalized way. But all over the world, what is to be done? So we have, again, initiated a movement to see whether the NAC can come forward to be the leaders to accredit all the higher education institutions in the world. For example, in the United States, already a few universities have started departments of yoga offering courses on master's degree and doctoral program. And we have to give the lead. For that purpose, now we are going to have a global summit in New York probably in April or so, to bring all the people to see that the NAC brings about the necessary accreditation process and will get accepted. <coughs> <coughs> this is how 
India should bring the traditional approach, evidence-based approach, and standardized procedures for yoga to be brought throughout the world so that all the yoga institutions in the world will have a synergetic approach to have the holistic dimensions of yoga. On side, it should have the traditional base, it should have the evidence base on the other side, and it should be very, very useful to the people at large. This has been our dream coming up. To make this possible and to bring the monetization, the Ministry of HRD has now started a new institution called Inter-University Center for Yogic Sciences. IUCS is the one that is going to monitor the progress of all the higher education yoga processes in the country, <coughs> in the departments of yoga in various universities. This is how standardization is coming. And gradually this is what is the need. And unless we have a standard protocol for each of the different dimensions, we will not grow further. <coughs> this has to be done. Similarly, a lot of people who treat various ailments also have to be very careful. Somebody said, yoga is yoga and we can use yoga for everything. I said, can you say, medicine is medicine and give the same medicine to all ailments? This is what one has to understand. Yoga therapy is a specialized thing. Taking care of the particular diseases, you should be able to tailor make the different yoga protocols for each of the disease. Similarly, insulin is good for diabetes. But if we give more insulin, what is going to happen, we know. They may even die, hypoglycemia. If we give less, the effect will be less. Similarly, how much of yoga to give, what yoga has to be given, when it has to be given, all has to be worked on in great detail. Unless we do that, we'll be working on a very shabby ground. And we will cause more harm than good in the yoga field. So over the last 40 years, our entire team has worked to bring about such protocols and the protocols have been standardized. In 1991, a book on yoga for common ailments was brought forth in London, simultaneously published in Sydney and also New York. In that, we have 18 different ailments for which these yoga protocols have been developed has become a sort of textbook for the people at large. Since then, there have been a lot of improvements that we have been doing which can be used. <coughs> this is how yoga can be a very big soft power which can spread throughout the world. Now yoga has become a big business in a sense abroad and it is $10 billion in 2016. And there is a lot of economics associated with that and we should not neglect this dimension as well. <coughs> So using that aspect also, we should grow further to see that it becomes a big contribution of India to the world thought and power. And today we have three panelists who are there with us and uh, they are going to share their experiences about how they are bringing yoga as a soft power throughout the world and what is their perception about this dimension and about them there will be interaction by Sudarshan and others I mentioned. Uh, the already introduction has been done. We can start with Gopi's presentation, followed by Noof and then Swar. Namaste. Can I have my slides back up, please? So I work for Google, and Google was founded 20 years ago. And 20 years ago, this was the world headquarters of Google. This garage here, or what we call car shed, was where Google was founded in Menlo Park, California. And if you had opened that car shed door and walked in, this is what you'd have seen. Larry Page, Sergey Brin, the founders of Google, sitting at what was the engineering center, the development office, sales office, all rolled into one. And their ambition at the time, the mission was to organize all of the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. In a sense, they were also trying to come up with this concept of join or union to join all of humanity with all of publicly available information and thereby be useful, make it useful and productive in their lives. And back then, this was their only and first product, a simple web page, pretty ugly by today's standards, and it could do only one thing, which is you type in a word 
it would give you a list of web pages that had the word in that. And fast forward 20 years later, the modern incarnation of, oops, that same web page looks like this, and now this is used in 200 countries and territories in 120 different languages, and a typical month it's used about 150 billion times. That's roughly 75 times for every human being on the internet. And it does pretty amazing things, and we've all taken it for granted, but if I were to just give you a little demo of it, without even thinking too much about it, we pull out these kind of devices, the deck of a size of playing card, and are able to have real conversations with it. Okay, Google, what is yoga? According to Wikipedia, yoga is a group of physical, mental, and spiritual practices or disciplines which originated in ancient India. Okay, Google, where can I study it? I found a few places within 18.3 kilometers. And among other places, it says Iyengar Yoga, Yoga Shema, and several others. And what he just witnessed is a pretty incredible act of computer science in that this device understands human language and speech and context. When I said, where can I study it, without even specifying what exactly do I want to study, it sort of knows from the context that I'm still in the conversation. All that is well and good, and this, we can say that they've accomplished tremendous things with that mission and vision that they had. Now, 2,600 years ago, in this land, another great movement started, what we now know as yoga, and its purpose was also union, union of that individual self with a larger sense of what we would call consciousness. And every week, those two things collide. This 20-year organization, Google, and this 2,600-year-old tradition comes together every week on the Google campus in scenes like this. It's a movement, it's a program, it's a yoga program for Googlers that I founded 13 years ago when I joined the company. It's called Yoglers, the yoga program for Googlers. And it happens all over the world. It has become one of the largest yoga programs in the world. There are 250 classes every single week, 250. But it started with one class that I did because one particular product manager, Matt Kowinski, kept persistently insisting that I teach him yoga once he found out that I was a yoga instructor. And what started with one student in one conference room has spread to be this 250 classes a week program. And it unfolds every week. And in my estimate, about 8,000 Googlers or so practice on a pretty regular basis. And it didn't happen all of a sudden. It took a lot of work over the 13 years. It's driven by a large group of volunteers who treat this as their karma yoga, their act of service, to grow this movement within this company. And it spread from office to office. In fact, this caught the attention of the Ministry of External Affairs as to why is this internet company embracing this ancient tradition. And two years ago, for the 70th anniversary, of India's independence, they produce a documentary called India Boundless. And for that documentary, they actually did a small uh, snippet of the Yoglers yoga program at Google. Can we have that uh, documentary, please? <coughs> Let me give it a second while it's coming up. We are heading to Silicon Valley in California, home to some of the largest tech corporations in the world. At the Googleplex, the corporate headquarters of the internet search engine giant, we connect with Gopi Kalail. Gopi is a hardcore technology evangelist at Google. Uh, we work in fairly demanding jobs, and much of what happens around the Google Flex is really innovating and solving some big problems out there using technology at scale, using real computer science, and using massive data at scale. But in the midst of all of this, the most important technology that we all have access to, all 7.1 billion people, is right here. I call it our inner net, which is our body, our mind, our breath, our consciousness, Drawing from his Indian roots, Gopi instituted Yoglas, a yoga and meditation program for Google employees worldwide. So while Google is helping the world to connect on the outside, the power of this great Indian internet helps Googlers to reconnect within. And it 
It's a fairly large, widespread global program. There are hundreds of people involved. And there's an acknowledgement that a program like yoga, for example, uh, that the original teachings come out of an Indian tradition and Indian heritage. I mean, it's a living science that has evolved in many different directions, along with other streams of meditation mindfulness that have emerged in other parts of the world. While technology giants worldwide are acquiring the Indian science of... So the question, back to the slides, please. So the question is often asked, why drives this level of interest among uh, the tech community, among Googlers, to take up this ancient 2,600-year-old practice? And in my opinion, there are two primary reasons. The first is, Googlers as a group understand that they thrive on ideas and innovation. It is like oxygen for the company. And ideas and innovation comes from this asset, from our body, from our brain, from our imagination, from our creativity. And Googlers intuitively have understood that these practices help put this asset, I call the inner net, into a state of peak performance. The second is, again, Googlers as a practical, rational group of people like tools, like, I call it settings. It's sort of like on your phone, you can do various settings and you can configure your app and optimize this device for your personal preference. In a similar way, as uh, Mr. Nagendra was explaining, yoga allows you to do these settings. The fact that it's a simple, portable practice that allows you to manage your internal settings. The fact that you can change your physical state, your emotional state, your mental state with just using your body, your breath, movement, attention, and intention, and all you need is your body on a blue yoga mat as far as the Hatha yoga practice is concerned. The Googlers found it very appealing, and the fact that they can take 45 minutes to the end of a day and quickly change their states was something that seems to have appealed to a lot of people. But a while ago, I started thinking that all of this is still primarily asana practice, and as Mr. Nagendra was explaining, that there is, this is a vast roaming philosophy, and I wanted to expose Googlers to the other aspects of yoga as well. I wanted them to get a taste of the four main paths of yoga, bhakti yoga, jnana yoga, raja yoga, and karma yoga. So I started organizing retreats from them in traditional yoga settings, primarily ashram settings, where yoga was originally practiced and developed. So I started taking yogas to traditional Indian ashrams, and the one I picked was the Shivananda ashram, because uh, I learned in that particular tradition. And there are several around the US established by Swami Vishnu Devananda, one of the great yoga masters uh, to come out of India who took yoga to the West as well. So let me show you a couple of pictures. Can we have the slides back up? So this is one of the retreats we did at the Shivananda Ashram in uh, the Bahamas. It's pretty, since it's close to us in the Caribbean. And this ashram follows a traditional Indian yoga setting. It's run by, well, you know, as traditionally as any Shivananda Ashram in India would. And if you stay there for a few days, you get exposed to all the four main paths of yoga. And every year or so, we take groups of Googlers and go on these retreats where they get a taste of the other dimensions of yoga besides just asana practice. And these are some pictures here. Here the group is posing on the yoga deck on the ocean in Vrakshasan or in Ekapada Hastasan. Obviously, they're having a lot of fun with it. And when we do these things together outside of a work context, it's a great way for team building in general and camaraderie. And these Googlers come from all over the world, from the London office, Toronto office, Mexico City, et cetera, and leading to obviously a state of joy and fun and bliss, the ultimate purpose of yoga. So all of this is uh, well and good, but I started asking the question, can we then push the boundaries and go past just simply asana practice or meditation, the two streams that seems to have caught the imagination of the West? And those come from the Raja Yoga path, and arguably, at least in my opinion, the, two har the, the, mo the hardest of the four paths of yoga. For me personally, Bhakti Yoga is the one that gives me the most uh, joy and the most rasa, especially Kirtan practice, and I started asking myself, can we actually have Kirtan at Google? And why not? At Google, we are raised with the sense of the possible. You never take no for an answer. So I decided to go big with it and ask the biggest name in Kirtan music in the West, 
a gentleman called Krishna Das. And Krishna Das was born Jeffrey Cagle into a Jewish family. He was a rock musician. And like many of the young people of his generation, came to India seeking answers. And he became a disciple of Neem Karoli Baba in Kenchi and eventually became the priest at the Kali Temple in uh, Kenchi. And when he went back to the U.S., uh, he became a Kirtan musician. Started off in a small way, now he's a big name, pulls in thousands of people at his concerts. And three years ago, his uh, album, Live Ananda, was one of the nominees for the Grammy in the New Age category. So I asked Krishna Das, and I have no money to pay him because his charge is quite big. And he agreed to do it. He said yes, and he said he'd do it for free. So we organized a Kirtan in, at Google, and just 100 meters or so from where CEO Sundar Pichai sits, in the middle of the day, the scene unfolded. Dozens of Googlers leaving their desks, whatever project they're working on. You know, they might have been working on trying to optimize Google Maps or a self-driving car, and here's what unfolded. Can we have the second video, please? Right, as you can see, Google is enjoying themselves and jamming away for Kirtan, and it looks just as joyful as any that you might find in a place like Vrindavan. So we're continuing to grow and build the moment, and for 2019, one of the goals I have, along with my Yogler ambassadors, is a goal called 100% 100% yoga. And what we mean by that is Google, every quarter you set yourself targets and you publicly declare it. So one of the targets I've set for myself and this team of volunteers is to bring 100% yoga to every single Google office. So what we're trying to do is, if you work at Google, any office anywhere in the world, about a certain size, 50 people is how we defined it, you'll have access to at least one free yoga class every week. And we are at 80% of that target now. In 2019, we hope to actually hit that 100% target. And we committed to the company, we would do it at zero dollars. We won't ask for any budget, we'll just be scrappy. So a lot of it is done by Googlers themselves who become yoga instructors, lead this practice, and in innovative ways we started doing it. So the 100% uh, yoga in every single office, major office around the world, is our goal for 2019. I want to close this off by telling you about what is my dream and vision behind yoga, much larger than giving a lot of Googlers access to this incredible practice that I've benefited from pretty much my entire life from the age of 19 when I ran away to an ashram to go live and study yoga and become a yoga teacher myself. So I've had the privilege of working at Google now for 13 years and it's been a privilege because I've found great meaning and context in the work that I do with the simple fact that every single day I feel the work I do or what my colleagues do actually touches the lives of hundreds of millions of people in a positive way. That we are connecting humanity with publicly available information with the intent that this information will then be useful to all of you for education, for entertainment, for enlightenment. And I want to tell you a personal story of how deeply I, connected, I feel connected with this sense of purpose. And for that I want to take you on a journey to a small rice farming village called Chitilanjeri. It's in Kerala in southern India, and this is where my roots go back to. And I'll be there actually tomorrow. I'm flying there back to uh, that area. 
And this is where my grandparents lived as poor rice farmers. They were marginal subsistence farmers cultivating a plot of land not much bigger than what this hotel occupies. This is where my parents grew up as the children of two poor rice farming families and they had a very, very modest life. They grew up without electricity. They grew up without running water. They don't have a college education. The only education they got was 10 years of schooling in a rural Indian village school. So modest at best. But they had aspirations for their four children, just like parents anywhere in the world will have. And thanks to those aspirations, their four children, that is me and my three siblings, we went on to get 10 college degrees, advanced degrees, including two from US Ivy League business schools, even though my parents had never set foot in America. So the question is often asked, what caused that kind of social mobility in one generation? It is very simply access to information. But when I was growing up, it was very slow access. For example, when I wanted to come up with a list of graduate schools that I wanted to apply to, I remember taking an eight-hour train journey from my college in Tiruchirappalli all the way to Chennai, eight-hour train journey, so that I could look at a physical copy of the US World News Guide to Graduate Schools at the USIS library. Today, of course, eight seconds feels too long on our phone. But we still got access to that information, and that's what propelled the family forward. Today, when I go back to the village and look at the village school where my mother studied, infrastructure-wise, it still looks pretty much the same, except for one difference. And this is a story unfolding, not just in Chitlanjeri, our village, but also tens of thousands of villages all over the world. And that is children with access to the internet and with the kind of technologies we're building at Google now have access to the same amount of information as somebody who goes to the Indian Institute of Technology, as somebody who's enrolled at the University of Oklahoma. So in an era where information is like oxygen, we are leveling the playing field for humanity. And in a sense, in a, I treat this as my karma yoga, because we have connected the 3.2 billion people who are on the internet with all publicly available information that is available for free, whether it's a TED Talk or a National Geographic video or just uh, uh, a Wikipedia entry on, some, on yoga that you might be interested in. So this is all amazing and it's great that we made this kind of progress. But there's a larger vision and intent I have around yoga and that is in the midst of all this, we still live in a world of a lot of divisiveness. There is that sense of separation, that sense of the other and that creates competition, that creates conflict, that creates confrontation. And it is my hope that as yoga spreads around the world and comes out of a traditional context in India, out of an ashram-like setting, and enters the world of, say, corporate sectors, whether it's Google or any other company, or all of the initiatives that uh, Mr. Nagender talked about as yoga continues to spread, that through the practice, all of the practitioners will find a true sense of union, a sense of that connection, that sense of that cooperation, that sense of community, so that when we actually sit at the end of a yoga class and say, Lokaha Samastaha Sukhino Bhavantu Om Shanti Shanti Shanti, it is no longer just a dream or an aspiration, but it's actually a true realization uh, of our state of being. This is my hope for where yoga will take us all, and this will be our greatest gift to mankind. Namaste. Thank you for your presentation, sir. We will now request Ms. Noof Marwai to uh, present. My fellow panelists, Dr. H. R. Nagindaraji, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, namaskar. It is my privilege and honor to be here among you, and I would like to thank India Foundation and the Center for Soft Power for putting me together in this wonderful confluence of people and ideas. Power as a concept often tends to be defined in a tangible or a hard terms. But in our world, for a long time now, real power perhaps lies somewhere else. 
There is no doubt that nations can manage more without force using the three pillars of soft power. Defined by Joseph Nye as the originator of the concept, political values, culture, and others. Imagine an underweight baby weighing a little over a kilogram at time of birth. Imagine a childhood spent battling illness, both known and unknown. Teenage life, accustomed, consumed by a quest to seek answers that plague you night and day and a lot of suffering. Now imagine that underweight baby who while growing up survived lupus, septicemia, and cancer. And for people who don't know what is septicemia here, septicemia is a condition when the whole blood gets inflamed and attacked by the antibodies. And rarely people survived this. I have survived this situation. And I stand here today in front of you because God has gifted me one thing, yoga, yoga practice. The greatest gift for humanity from India, what I call my second home. For thousands of years, the world has been blessed to have holistic approach to health and well-being, not just for us as individuals, but also strikes harmony between man and nature. Till I was 18, I never had a day where my ill health did not pull me down in some way. I even had to stop school for one year. A few days of doing basic yoga asanas made me forget all the pain and filled me with the hope that I too could have a normal life one day. As the Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji told the United Nations General Assembly in his maiden speech in 2015, yoga embodies the unity of mind and body, thought and action, restraint and fulfillment, and it's not about exercise, but to discover the sense of oneness with yourself, the world, and nature. We often talk about soft powers and the influence they wield in bridging countries. And today, I stand here in front of you. I can assure you that is far more effective than any policy or bilateral agreements between nations. Every year, India gets approximately around 10 million visitors from all over the world coming to you to learn yoga and become the ambassadors of its love and its greatness in the heartbeat. Today, the Prime Minister Modiji's vision that made the International Day of Yoga a reality has transformed the lives of practitioners like me around the world and thought if we have formed an emotional bond with India. In 2018, my company, Nof International, began importing handicrafts and handlooms from India. A decade ago, everyone in Saudi Arabia wanted to import goods from China, and they were wary of India despite the traditional connection with India. There was something that the two countries and the youth from the two countries were not able to embrace each other. In Saudi, the Indian community would think twice before interacting with Saudis outside of their workplace. And Saudis will feel distant from the Indian diaspora, which is one of the largest in my country. I saw a resurgence in my country's main interest in India from the time I started teaching yoga and speaking about Ayurveda in Riyadh and Jeddah. The fascination with yoga and by extension yoga increased manifold after the first international day of yoga. Everywhere I went, people asked me about India. Many of you here would think a Saudi fallen in love with yoga an American benefiting from Ayurveda, or a Japanese national excelling at Bharatanatyam, is a success of India's soft power. 
It is something more than that. Since I have been practicing yoga, India was the last place one would connect to it despite yoga originated here. American companies would certify yoga and have the right to approve or disapprove. The fact that this is changing as I'm standing here and as Dr. Nagindara has mentioned about the Ayush Ministry and the QCI regulations of the yoga system, it is really changing. And this is the success of soft power. The International Day of Yoga is an epoch-making change that has made Indians aware of their power. There are many changes taking place in Saudi Arabia as well, and they are truly empowering women. Be it women being allowed to drive or visit football matches, cinema theaters are opening up, and making wearing an abaya or the cover is an optional choice have happened in the last couple of years. Many of these changes, especially what one would call soft, in this aspect, sports, sports has played a great and important role. Many years ago, a lot of women in Saudi Arabia started many sports in their own circles like me, and now they lead in their fields. The appointment of Her Royal Highness Princess Rima bint Bandar Al Saud as the deputy of the sports authority has been a watershed moment. That can, what can be a bigger example of women empowerment in Saudi Arabia through sports than my friend Lena Maina, who has been appointed as a member of Majlis Ashura in 2016. The Shura Council is a formal advisory body of Saudi Arabia with the power to propose laws to the king and the powers to interrupt laws with Lena being and Princess Rima in the General Sports Authority. It is not, not less, nothing less than a new dawn for women's sports and authority in Saudi Arabia. Many of my friends in Jeddah, both Saudis and Indians as well, from the Indian community, suddenly rediscovered each other around 2015 when the first United Nations International Day of Yoga took place. There was a great buzz about understanding yoga and learning yoga with each passing year. The number of people only increased. I myself have trained more than 8,000 people in yoga since 2004. And I, <laughs> and I have certified around 600 people and there are women teaching around Saudi Arabia yoga in every city you can imagine. I'm grateful that our authority approved the listing of yoga as a sport in November 2017. And with the help of Princess Rima and emotional support she extended to my journey in every step. If the average Saudi and I don't mean the ones hailing from bigger cities like Riyadh and Jeddah rediscovered India through yoga. The Indian in Saudi Arabia found a friend in the Prime Minister Modiji and the Minister of External Affairs Srimati Sushma Suraji. During their visit to my country, both inspired every Indian living to be the ambassadors in their own way. And for the information, India was the guest of honor this year in Saudi Arabia for the traditional festival of Janad Riyah. And yoga was the theme. I'll show you pictures where yoga was the whole theme of that event. If Mudiji came across a visionary, as a, a visionary leader to not just the Desi community in Saudi Arabia, but also young Saudis like us, I'm so surprised in several meetings regarding sports or other events, many people knew about the Yoga Day and knew about Narendra Modiji's um, visions and support for yoga. Sushmaji embraced the NRIs like an elder in the house who made sure nothing could harm them once they became her family. Some critics could say these are political overtures 
But what they don't take in the consideration is the connection that people of our two countries have formed and thanks to yoga and the Indian cuisine and the films. Our cultures have a deeper common bond than most of us would know. Did you know that the Hijazi sweets in Saudi Arabia are similar to Indian sweets and we still call them laddus? Hijaz is where I come from. It's the region of Mecca and Medina and Jeddah. And we still, sometimes the old people will call the women dress the kurta. And we used to Im import the bridal dresses from, the Indi from India even in the 40s and before in Hijaz. We still cook biryani in special occasions. I feel proud that my own in my own capacity, I'm playing a role in bringing our cultures closer. The stronger ties that our countries have formed under the Prime Minister Modi and our King, uh, King Salman bin Abdulaziz, and the personal rapport that Modi and his, uh, and his Royal Highness, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman share, is an inspiration for Saudis as myself and Indians within this room. <laughs> Cities and towns all, as well across India and Saudi Arabia. It's not a regular thing when young Saudis from tribal regions such as Al-Aflaj, Al-Kharj, and al Ghassim make a beeline and travel to India to learn more about yoga and the culture. It is something extraordinary, and we are all part of it. In the end, I would once again like to express my thanks to India's foundation and the Center for Soft Power for giving me the chance to be here and share this experience with you. I would like to show a small presentation. It just uh, to show the journey of yoga in Saudi Arabia and... Um, do I have... Is this the one? Yeah. Okay. So I'll explain about some pictures. Um, this is in the National Guard Hospital. It's a military hospital. And it's about breast cancer. We spoke about yoga for breast cancer. And uh, the two are, one is a doctor, and she's a yoga teacher. And the other one is um, a health educator and she's also a yoga teacher who is now in India, in Rishikesh, learning some yoga. Uh, this is from our initiative for multiple sclerosis with King Abdulaziz University in Jeddah. And we were sponsors. We, since 2004, provide free training and free classes for people with autoimmune diseases and cancer. So we, we extended our support to the MS Foundation. This is a big event happened with the Gold Gym in all their branches, and it was about yoga and breast cancer. And we could not accommodate the number of women came to the centers to attend the classes for yoga and breast cancer. This is, um, this actually is a training program we have done for, a group of uh, yoga students with the support of the consulate of India. And this was the graduation. And she's one of the best students. She's a horse rider. Uh, she's a Saudi lady as well. And she's a very dedicated yoga practitioner. She spoke about her journey with depression and how yoga helped her on TV. This is also from our programs with the Indian consulate. This is also one of our programs. This was in the American consulate. And actually, the wife of the consul herself attended our classes for eight months continuously. And she had an event with us. This was a trail. We were trying to see if Saudi women will wake up at 6 a.m. on a Friday, which is off in Saudi Arabia, and come to practice yoga. And we were surprised, surprised with 110 women came, and we started at 7 a.m. sharp. <laughs> this is a speech I gave about naturopathy, career guidance, and yoga in the Indian school in India. 
And this is about the yoga day we have done in Saudi Arabia for the Indian school for the kids. This is also the first yoga day. People were laughing on the stage. We had an expert for laughter yoga. So we have eminent personalities and diplomats are standing there, some public figures and all are laughing. This is from this embassy in Riyadh. She is also one of our students, Sara. She is a very advanced practitioner and she led the yoga day protocol in the embassy in 2016. 17, I think. And this is from 2017. This yoga day celebration happened with the support of uh, Saudi sports authorities. This was the event. And many people came. We have people from different nationalities. This is from an event in Riyadh. And this is a beautiful article about Saudi women being engines for change. And she spoke about particularly yoga. Um, this is the first official event under the support of Sports Authority of Saudi Arabia and Her Royal Highness Princess Rima under her patronage. We performed an Ashtanga yoga series uh, with our team. And this is the team was preparing for the performance in that event. It was in the um, Sports Authority Stadium. This is Princess Rima who's behind getting yoga listed as a sport in Saudi Arabia. She supported me and adopted me. This was an interview in an Indian channel. So this was the theme for Janadriya festival. We had Vrikshasan, this tree pose. So pe visitors came and they practiced yoga in Riyadh in Janadriya festival. This is from our trip in Rishikesh. These are all Saudi yoga teachers. We have been invited by Swami Baba Ramdev. And he took us on a tour to his university and research center. We got the publications as well and we were impressed. So in that group, six were doctors and yoga teachers as well. And they loved the, the trip because we have been exposed to yoga as a medical science in that uh, visit. Uh, this is the Yoga Ratna Award from the Asian Yoga Federation by the Chief Minister of Kerala. I was awarded in September. And this is a picture that I love. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, may I now request Ms. Suhag Shukla to address the gathering? Namaste. You can respond back. Namaste. Thank you. Just want to make sure everyone's still awake, um, or at least we had a tea break. But many thanks uh, to the organizers and the sponsors of this amazing conference. Um, Every session, one after the another, has been so enlightening, and um, it's really a show of the direction that India is going. You can probably surmise by my accent and possibly my approach that I'm American, but my heart beats Indian, so I'm really honored to be here, and especially to talk to you about yoga. Can we uh, get my deck? Thank you. Should I point it? Yeah. There we go. Okay. So, and even Bollywood have long colored the world's imagination of what India offers the senses. But it's India's civilizational contributions in the realm of the sacred, yoga, Ayurveda, Vedanta, religious pluralism, classical arts, and vegetarianism that have the power to feed the world's soul. And while the supply chain of the former has traveled around the world largely intact, the latter, the exportation of that which is sacred, and very often Hindu, has often entailed deliberate delinking of the spirit of these ancient systems in order to make them more palatable, dare say more marketable. Yoga in the West has largely been delinked from its Hindu roots for this reason. 
And now as the Indian government promotes International Yoga Day, and many Hindu gurus and spiritual teachers continue to spread their teachings, they too are oftentimes replicating, on, possibly un unintentionally, a similar delinking. The Hindu American Foundation, the preeminent advocacy organization serving the needs of Hindu Americans, of which I'm a co-founder and serve as the executive director, sought to tackle the multi-billion dollar yoga industry's delinking of Hindu and yoga with our Take Back Yoga, Bringing to Light Yoga's Hindu Roots campaign, also known as TBY. The largely successful campaign landed on the front page of the New York Times and received wide coverage by major media, including the Washington Post, CNN, Al Jazeera, The Guardian, Open Magazine, and scores of other mainstream media outlets, sparking international dialogue and awareness. In the decades since TBY's launch, HAF has arrived at nuanced approaches from many of the lessons learned that today the Indian government and others could possibly benefit from in their messaging around yoga. Tonight, I will share HAF's experiences in striving to balance the sacred and secular and explore ways in which we can collectively align the narratives around yoga to ensure that both the integrity of yoga is preserved and protected, and that the benefits of it, because it is a soft power after all, are widely shared. So first I'll just cover um, what we have seen in America and what sparked our Take Back Yoga. So the image here is actually my handwriting on the magazine that we were reading that catapulted this, um, this uh, campaign. I was sitting in the waiting room of a math class for my kids and thumbing through, they had a yoga journal um, there on the, on the counter and I was thumbing through it. There was a Gayatri Mantra, which was the mantra of the month. There were stories on Christian yoga, Kabbalah yoga, Zen Buddhist yoga. But the one word that seemed to be missing was Hindu. And so you can see that Yoga Journal is, is kind of a leader um, in the yoga industry. It has 1.8 million readership per year, 99,000 e-readers, meaning tablet and phone readers, and 14 million page views. So in other words, it's an influencer. And so we came up with a position paper um, and the position paper's name was Yoga Beyond Asana, Hindu Thought in pra Practice, and launched Take Back Yoga in order to shed light on yoga's Hindu roots. A debate ensued on the pages of the Washington Post on faith section between co-founder Asim Shukla, also my better half, and Deepak Chopra. Chopra misrepresenting TBY as a claim of ownership and saying that yoga was not Hindu. Over the years, we've finessed our messaging based on the lessons learned from the opposition and critique of our work, and more clearly restated our basic premise, which is threefold. Yoga is much more than asana. Yoga is rooted in Hindu concepts. And though yoga is rooted in Hinduism, Hinduism does not own yoga, nor does one have to be Hindu to practice yoga. Going back just a little bit, so before our position paper, we also wrote a letter to the editor. And we provocatively asked, is Hindu the new H word? And our suspicions were, uh, were confirmed when we called and someone at the journal said, well, yeah, we do kind of avoid the word Hindu because, you know, it carries a lot of baggage. To which we were scratching our heads saying, well, most religious traditions, if we look at what oftentimes happens, do carry baggage, but that doesn't take away from the, the philosophies and practices that they promote and the ideals that they wish to promote. So there you can see some footage of the Take Back Yoga campaign as it was covered on CNN. So the Academy in the United States has also been involved in delinking yoga from its Hindu roots. Theories have ranged from the suggestion that Patanjali was likely Buddhist, 
which is not to say that there are not Buddhist, Sikh, and Jain forms of yoga based on their respective uh, interpretations to the most recent popular, po the popular theory that postural yoga stems from Indian exposure to and copying of Scandinavian gymnastics. Even the Take Back Yoga campaign has become the topic of academic study. Some 65 academic articles cite to it, including the Harvard Business School, which covers it rather positively in a unit on the branding of yoga. Others are critical of the campaign's relinking of yoga to Hinduism with a range of hypotheses that oftentimes misrepresent the intent and arguments made by TBY or misinterpret them. Most scholars who are critical of TBI, uh, TBY incidentally have never bothered calling us um, to really find out what our intentions and interpretations were. So what have we seen in some of the messaging that's coming from India? International Day of Yoga is explained as a moment to celebrate India's contribution to world civilizations with the introduction of yoga as a physical, mental, and spiritual practice. Following the adoption and widespread celebrations of Yoga Day, however, controversy quickly ensued when a number of uh, organizations and institutions from minority religions in India expressed concerns about celebrations imposing and making mandatory an essentially Hindu practice. In response, officials quickly offered backtracking statements with tweets such as, yoga should not be con connected with any particular religion, or we are not forcing people to do yoga, there is no religion in it. Or, health is wealth and yoga is the key to that. It should not be linked with any religion. In fact, all of the government or official statements thus far have studiously avoided or even denied the term Hindu, including the official descriptors of yoga's origins. Several officials even appear to equate yoga with just asana and other physical aspects. If you look at the common protocol, which I think is a very welcome addition, especially when in the United States, 200 hours can qualify a yoga teacher um, to, to teach classes, and that can oftentimes jeopardize the well-being of students when you don't have someone who is really steeped in a tradition. Protocols are good things. But you'll notice in the origins of a description of yoga, there's one word missing. And here, as you look at this description, indeed the history here is not disputable. Everything stated here is true. But the absence of a specific mention of Hindu contributions, while it may be understandable because of the optics of a quote-unquote Hindu party promoting a quote-unquote Hindu practice in a secular democracy, it's still deeply problematic and has consequences of not only being able to extract the fullest potential of yoga's soft power, but also to the global understanding of Hinduism, the international standing of Hindus, and the integrity of the yoga tradition itself. And lastly, even prior to the advent of the International Yoga Day, many Indian gurus and spiritual teachers have also fallen prey to the same avoidance. While the reasons vary and are also not untrue, such as insisting that yoga or Hindu is a foreign term or stating that the ultimate aim of yoga is to transcend the man-made labels and identities that more often divide us, the consequences of not equating Hindu with Indian, Vedic, Sanatan Dharma or yogic are still the same. So you might be thinking, well, what's the big deal, Hindu, Hindu, Hindu? So I just want to go over some of those consequences. Having been immersed in the Western yoga community for more than two decades, now we've seen firsthand how many yoga magazines and yoga products try to distance themselves from ever using the word Hindu, preferring to use yogic, Vedic, and Indic. We've even seen them try to feebly claim that the various traditions of yoga are beyond time and space, predate Hinduism, or don't belong to any specific tradition. While this may seem of little consequence to Indians, most of whom will no doubt identify all of the traditions, darshana, the sacred texts mentioned in the, in the common yoga protocol or in Western yoga magazines as being part of Hinduism, 
readers from the rest of the globe don't understand or may not realize that Vedic and Upanishadic heritage refers to the heart of Hindu dharma. They may not understand that the theistic traditions of Shaiva, Vaishnava, and Tantric traditions refer to the different strands of Hindu society, all of which are very much thriving today. So then, what are Hindus and Hinduism left with? We're left with tired old colonial narrative of snake charmers and idol worshipers, caste and cow caricatures, and primitive and poor people. It is against this background, then, that the omission of the word Hindu by both the West and many Indians not only undermines the tradition, but also years of efforts by Hindu organizations, scholars, and thought leaders who have worked hard to explain yoga as far more than just a physical practice, and that it's rooted in Hindu concepts such as the eternal blissful nature of the soul, of dharma, of karma, of samsar, and moksha as the ultimate aim of life, and the Hindu articulations on consciousness. It's also a missed opportunity to better educate the global public about the greatest strength of Hinduism, and yet another example of Indic soft power, and that is religious pluralism resulting from the religious freedom accorded to every individual to seek truth and tread our own path to reach our fullest potential, and the respect that must be accorded to others for the right to do so. This type of messaging would only further emphasize the fact that you can be of any background and still practice and benefit from yoga. Indeed, Hindu is a foreign term, and not one the ancient rishis used to define or label themselves. But in modern times, it is the word that is generally associated with those of us who happen to be born into the legacy of the ancient rishis and have been inspired to live our lives according to their teachings of ahimsa, brahmacharya, bhakti, satsang, and seva, ikam sat vipraha bahuda vadanti, and vasudeva kutumbakam. Many have also argued that Hinduism, and by extension, its practices, including yoga, is not a religion, but a spiritual science or a way of life. While there is truth in these descriptions as well, the argument falls short when the general understanding of religion in the framework of civil and human rights law is that a religion is a collection of sincerely held beliefs, worldviews, and cultural systems related to existential questions such as the relationship with material existence and the supernatural or the purpose of life. In this context, then, Hinduism absolutely is a religion, although unique among the world's religions as it has no identifiable beginning in history, no single founder or prophet, no central religious establishment or sole authoritative scripture, scripture and generally does not proselytize or seek conversion. It is also crucial to understand that there are adherents of other world religions that come together at various influential international platforms to define religious freedom or to defend religious minorities. So we must take ownership of the terms Hindu and Hinduism and define on our own terms who we are, what we do, and what we believe, lest we remain voiceless on the global scale. In delinking yoga from its religious foundation, yoga has also grown to be equated with just asana and has become over-commercialized. Most of what is billed as yoga around the world, specifically the US, is not the yoga described in the Yoga Sutra or any of yoga's seminal texts or traditions. Rather, it has morphed into a form of asana without devotion, understanding, or reflection, and therefore, more akin to mere exercise. Case in point, you can register for naked yoga, beer yoga, cat, dog, or goat yoga. And so these are the types of yogas and an end result when you delink the sacred aspects um, from yoga. And it no longer looks like a quest for selfless service, loving devotion to God, the pursuit of truth and knowledge, or chitta vrit nirodaha. The result is a decline of yoga as an inward spiritual quest. 
And lastly, who are we bending over backwards for? 65% of Americans believe that many religions can lead to salvation, so we don't have to be so self-conscious of the roots of yoga. 30% of Americans say that they're spiritual and not religious. And 24% of Americans believe in reincarnation. So many of the concepts that are rooted um, in the yoga systems are things that many Americans are actually attracted to. So what is the path forward? As a secular democracy, India, of course, has to be conscious of not mi mixing um, India, uh, religion and state. And therefore, there's a need to balance the sacred and secular, or in other words, the soft power and benefits of yoga with the sensitivities of other communities who may feel celebrations are an imposition of Hindu practices. And it will need to remain truthful in its claims about yoga and its benefits so as to not politicize that which is truly beneficial to all people and backgrounds. At the, at the Hindu American Foundation, we faced a similar struggle because in the United States, the US Constitution requires that religion and state be separate. And so we struggled with the questions of where we know that yoga and all of the scientific research behind it shows that it's beneficial to children for, with ADHD, with hyperactivity. Are we going to deprive students if we equate yoga with a religious tradition, um, deny them of the possible benefits um, that yoga offers? And we came up with a, it's really just a balance of, of narrative that you can say that something has roots, that yoga as a whole has roots in, in Hinduism, but that it's universally available to all, and that there are aspects that are just physical that can benefit students and uh, be uh, compliant with the requirements of separation of church and state as we see it in the United States. So similarly, the government of India to, for those communities that might feel uncomfortable with a government that's promoting yoga as a whole, certainly could offer yoga asana, yoga therapy, pranayam, and some of the other physical aspects. But be careful to avoid some of the religious mantras and symbols that uh, would keep yoga um, still whole as a practice for private entities to offer, uh, but not have the government enter. Hinduism is a religion, and yoga is, is at its heart, through karma, bhakti, raj, and gnan. But as a non-proselytizing, inclusive, and syncretic religion, Hinduism never compels practitioners of yoga to profess allegiance to the tradition or convert. Thus, balancing the sacred and secular is possible by being honest about yoga as a spiritual science and a religious discipline to ensure that Hindus as a people can take pride in our civilizational contribution and have agency in defining who we are as a people and protecting our most vulnerable, and to see that the integrity of yoga is preserved and the benefits of it are widely shared. Thank you. Uh, we have incredibly run out of time, but we will take just two questions. And they, we'll take it together and we'll let the panelists answer. Just two. One this side and one Yoginiji. Yeah. Two to the last row. Sumati and Yoginiji. Mics, please. Either is that last row, last row. Hi, I'm Sumati and I uh, Has she WhatsApped her question no, to you? Or she, no, I've read it on her face. Okay, in that case, <laughs> I have to cut out her question. Face also. cheating. Okay. No, no, no. Go ahead. Gopiji, this is about uh, the element of Kirtan that you are exploring. And I'm very thrilled, happy, and any positive emotion that you can associate with it because I, in particular, associate a lot with Kirtan, especially the last seven years. How is Kirtan received and perceived as an element in the practice of yoga when you approach it there? Okay. We'll just take the question and then we can answer. Yogini ji. Mic. No, no, he'll give the mic. Yeah. 
Thanks to all for the lovely presentation and to other, peop all other presenters too. My question to you is, to, is this, that you talked about um, how you have, through dialogue, attempted to bring in the aspects of Hinduism into yoga and maintain that uh, link of yoga and Hinduism. Uh, there have been a few studies in the past couple of years in terms of chanting uh, also helping brain, and they've done brain mapping and MRIs and all of that. Have you tried to take that route and explain how Gayatri Mantra can help in increasing, so the Gayatri Mantra done during the yoga can help in increasing other activity of the brains also? Yeah. Alok sir, last question. Uh, my question is to Nauf. I just wanted to know, uh, in your quest for spreading yoga into Saudi Arabia, have you ever faced any opposition from the radical Islamists or the Wahhabi ideology? Because to them, yoga may be an antithesis of what their beliefs are. Okay. All, all our panelists have a question. Is Go ahead. Check, check. So, was the lady's name Sumati? Sumati. Thank you, Sumati, for that question. So bringing Kirtan music in, we just took a leap forward because the first premise of that was that yoga is much more than asana practice, as Shanak was saying. And there are these other four aspects from karma yoga, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga. And at least the uh, sales proposition was it's the cheapest and easiest path of yoga as compared to the Raja Yoga traditions of the Ashtanga path, which is a lot, you need intense amount of discipline. So we bring that in with an openness, saying who is interested can embrace it. At the base level, it's all about music, and that's one thing that is universal to human beings, in that music can be enjoyed. So somebody simply open to music, rhythm, uh, cadence, etc., gets may get drawn to it, and and then it's it's what I'm offering is just a portal to this incredible practice that is accessible to everyone and then explain some of the concepts as to why it's 60 to 80 beats per minute because it's meant to calm your body down. It's what lullabies are designed around that nursery rhymes. So starting with that, but more than anything, it is communal singing and in all traditions they have, have it. And at least within the Google uh, environment, it's a population that is extremely open to cultural influences from around the world. It's no different from I could be offering some kind of Native American group singing and they'll embrace it and try it out it could be gospel singing and they would be drawn to it as well. So um, I'm working with a population that is very open and receptive to cultural influences that exist around the human condition. But people come out to it with curiosity and leave moved by it. And that's where the magic happens. And that's when they had the first taste, the rasa of this practice. Uh, and I was surprised that in, a, in the main Google headquarters, we've tried it a few times, but when I went to the Sao Paulo office, I was completely struck by the fact that there's a Brazilian yoga teacher who's a Kirtan singer, and she does it every Wednesday in the Sao Paulo office, and completely on their own, they brought it and made it a regular weekly practice. So there is hope for us there. Go next? Okay. Um, I, we have followed the research um, on, on chanting. There's also, also a great deal of research being done on mindfulness. And there are ways that, you know, we have schools consulting because oftentimes community members go in, in the American context, um, where, where our advice has, has uh, gone in that direction is to say that the school itself should, it can offer the physical aspects, but in terms of chanting, those are things that community groups can come in afterwards after school because other churches and many other organizations come in after school, not on official school time, to offer these and because there are benefits to it. Uh, but once the school starts offering it, that's when those lawsuits, if any of you have followed, have come up is when schools officially, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but. Okay. Uh, to answer your question, you might be surprised if I tell you, till the approval of the yoga day, I have never been attacked by any person you might call religious or whatever the ideology is. In fact, one of my Saudi students, she's a Quran teacher, and she's a fitness instructor, and she became a yoga teacher now. Um, I have a lot of students who are actually graduated from Sharia and Islamic studies. 
they are practicing yoga and they are teaching yoga now and they can actually understand and choose what is suitable for them because what we do is asana pranayama relaxation and we connect this to the medical aspects of it. Um, till the approval of the yoga day, I was, yes, people ran campaigns in social media, but none of them were a Saudi, was a Saudi. None of them was an Arab. I'll be very honest here. It's from the Asian nationalities who live in Saudi Arabia or abroad. And for your surprise, I have also taught some Pakistanis and they are yoga teachers now in Saudi Arabia. I answer it? Yes. Okay. So we had, <coughs> we had three beautiful presentations which shows how yoga is being <coughs> accepted at large from various dimensions and <coughs> coming up of the Google, Google <coughs> taking care of uh, spread of yoga is a great thing and welcome for spreading this down to the grassroots. And I congratulate you for doing this possible through the Google and I'm sure it will spread to great dimensions with the traditional holistic approach of yoga. As you rightly pointed out, all the four streams, Nani Yoga, Raj Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga are being brought forth and that's what being shown from some of the slides by her and other people. I'm so glad that it's spreading in Islamic countries also, and they have been a pioneer in seeing this. It spreads into every nook and corner of this thing. And uh, giving the evidence base would convince people to a greater extent than just telling that yoga is this. So that's what we have to do, and more and more research has to come and publish papers in the best of the journals of the world. Then we have authentic um, usefulness of yoga on all aspects of it particularly in the field of cancer, <coughs> as was asked, MD Anderson Cancer Center, the biggest cancer center in the world has taken up this research for breast cancer and yoga, and a big study of 660 patients of breast cancer in a three-arm trial, in a multi-center thing. And the results are coming up soon, and wonderful results have come. So yoga can be a very effective adjunct to the modern medical system, and gradually can grow to show its effectiveness for prevention and promotion of positive health. What is needed in the world at large is essentially <clears throat> to bring yoga as a preventive measure and promotion of positive health. So our country has taken up a big launch to set up the wellness centers throughout the country. One and a half lakh, 150,000 wellness centers are being set up by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and each center has been provided with 25 lakhs of rupees. Imagine the budget that the government has put. And it's here that yoga can come up in a very big way to see that its contribution to prevention and promotion of positive health, reducing the health budget to a great extent can play a very important role throughout the things. So this is how our government is in the right direction, bring, bringing yoga in the field of education, in the field of health and other dimensions. Thank you very much for all of you. Very much. We thank all our panelists and the chair for a very engaging discussion. Um, may I now request Nagendra ji to felicitate our distinguished panelists. Mr. Gopi Kalayel. Ms. Noof Marvai. <laughs> Ms. Suhag Shukla. I will now request Sri Harikiran Vadlamani, Member Board of Governors of India Foundation, to felicitate Nagendra ji.
We will now break for five minutes and re reassemble right here for the next session on cinema. Thank you. <laughs>